Karakura Horomiya. Mr. Speaker, back in 1989, Willie Fenua Elder and New Zealand Māori Council member Sir Graham Latimer went to court on behalf of Māori to challenge the government's right to sell land that was subject to a historical treaty claim, Treaty of Waitangi claim. It was decided that land would not be sold, although assets on the land such as forests could be sold. The decision instead was to have the land remain in Crown control because it was realised that the land could potentially form part of a future settlement of grievances under the Treaty of Waitaki, and that's what's happening in this bill. Aside from Sir Graham's actions ensuring the Crown maintained ownership and control of the land, he also ensured, along with others, that the rental of the property to forestry owners generated an income that went into the Crown Forestry Rental Trust. The trust accrued rental and the interest on it, and Māori were able to access that rental in order to advance the Treaty of Waitangi claims. With the Whanganui Iwi, Whanganui Kaitoki Prison, and northern part of Whanganui Forest on a count settlement bill, we have reached a point where some of that land that would have been sold but for the actions of the Māori Council and Sir Graham is being returned to Māori in the Whanganui area, and it is certainly something to celebrate. The principle that saw owners of Florence pay rental to the Crown landowners is also being applied to land under the Kaitoki Prison. The land that the Kaitoki Prison sits on becomes Māori owned, but the buildings remain the property of the Crown. The Crown then rents the land and Māori get to derive a rental income from it. The land in question had overlapping iwi interests, which caused some interesting debates and discussions. And these overlapping interests are one of the key challenges in many treaty settlements. It is a difficult area with no easy answers. And in these situations, the Crown has an obligation to negotiate with both iwi in good faith. The Whanganui iwi and Ngāti Appa have come to an arrangement, and it is an incredible uh, achievement. It is a huge credit to both iwi. In my opinion, counts now is not so much what the past held, but what the future holds for these iwi and their commitment and their connection through the debate and getting to a better place is something that we can all take lessons from. They now have an opportunity to put grievances to one side and focus on a successful future for themselves and the mokopuna of the future generations. That, Mr Speaker, in my opinion, is a key objective in the settlement of treaty claims. It provides the opportunity for Māori to emerge from the shadow of grievance and into the light and dawn of a prosperous future. And the Minister needs to be commended for the effort that he has put into it. I also want to commend myself and other people in the Labour government who, who worked hard on the settlement. Uh, I thought I'd better say that too. But, but I do want, to, do want to commend the Minister and his colleagues for that. Because um, people forget to say it. <laughs> Nothing will ever compensate for the fragmentation and the degradation of the land, culture, language, social, political and economic opportunities caused by alienation from land. This puts a lot of that red, right from Ngāti Upper and the Whanganui Iwi. It is the alienation of the Māori language, as the former Speaker talked about in relation to the Select Committee's activities. Mr Speaker, which leads me to the main concern that the Māori Affairs Select Committee report commentary in the Māori Select Board Committee report commentary. A small but significant part of the Māori language for Whanganui people. A simple letter, the letter H, nowhere in the Māori language in any Māori dictionary can one find the word wanga. It sounds more like Aborigine. It has no meaning, no connection, no mana or status of any kind to any tribe, not just the Whanganui tribes. It is not a world that exists. Therefore, it is with immense satisfaction that the word Whanganui has been erased from this piece of legislation and replaced with the real Māori name of Whanganui. It strikes me as the ultimate act of arrogance that the language of one people can be taken control of by another ethnic group. I struggle to comprehend how Pahe and Whanganui can believe he has any right to deny Māori the correct use of our language. But certainly as we are all encouraged as New Zealanders by the haka and mana and aroha are commonly used words. We know that there are a lot better Pākehā who do appreciate the word Whanganui and are certainly supportive of it. The iwi of Whanganui have the right 
to walk through the CBD of Whanganui and see their language written correctly and to hear it pronounced correctly. It is no different to what most cultures would appreciate and expect of other people. Respect is a two-way street, but to many, the only view respect in non-Māori, the only view respect from within their own cultural bias. And the effort that has been put in by this tuui to consolidate and settle this uh, settlement along with the minister and co is something that needs to be recognised and respected. I'm thrilled that throughout this bill the meaningless word Whanganui has been replaced by Whanganui. Over the coming years, Whanganui will subsume Whanganui in all legislation, on all signposts, AA, and in the consciousness of all people, and history will look back at objections to changing the name Whanganui to Whanganui as what it blatantly is, a redneck attack on the rights of indigenous people to practice their language and culture on their own terms. The ancient Whanganui debate reminds me of the furore over the correct pronunciation of Topo and the outrage and indignation expressed when Joanna Paul opened the news with Kia ora. And likewise, the battle Nada Glavish had when, as a telephone exchange operator, she was demoted for greeting callers with Kia ora. So we should take a collection on every party who says Kia ora now. But it is an accepted use of language in this country, and it is a wonderful, uh, it is wonderful unification. And if we are serious about name, nationhood, then the essence of this bill is just that. It can help to leverage that and be serious about recognising and respecting other people's wills and needs. And so it is for me with the name Whanganui, a Whanga can picture. Where I come from, there's two meanings. One meaning is a noun, the other meaning is a verb. But both conjure a picture in my mind. Whanga means either a bay and nui means something large, in which case... When I hear Whanga and Nui combined, a picture of a large bay springs to mind. I use this example to attempt to explain our connection to our language, and it is not there just for fun. It is something many non Māori would understand, and it is certainly a joy to share that knowledge with them. I do find it incredibly ironic that, as I've said, one of the literal translations of Whanga Nui could mean a long wait which is exactly what Whanganui we had to, have had to experience to get to the stage where a fraction of their land is about to be returned, not as compensation, but as the right thing to do to correct historical injustices. To finish, Mr Speaker, I would like to acknowledge the work of the two Poho Working Party who have worked hard, who have had to stand and stare down people and work and develop with them, who undertook a robust ratification program to ensure the deed of on account settlement was well supported by Whanganui Iwi. Ka nui ngā mihi atu ki a rātou koutou katoa. E tautoko tia atu te kaharawa i roti a rātou, Mr Speaker. Mai rāno mō tō rātou kaha e taipai atu i tēnei uh, wahi. Nō reira, tēnā tātou.